Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's show about living in an association. In past shows, I've mentioned the fact that about 38% of our population lives in some form of an association. So we're all subject to, those who live there anyway, are subject to the rules and obligations of living in an association and oftentimes just misunderstood. I would like to say at the beginning of this show, again, that our hearts go out to those on the Big Island who are struggling with the effects of the volcano. And I don't want to forget my good friends on Kauai who had the massive floods down in the, in the, in the North Shore area of Kauai too, who also, we sometimes forget talking about the volcano so much, are also struggling after the aftermath of that great flooding. Which brings to mind the magic word we all think about, insurance. So I asked a good friend of mine, Ron Sukamaki from Atlas Insurance Agent, who's a pro beyond pro in all these matters, to come visit with us today and talk about insurance for associations. So Ron, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank T you. Tell us a little about yourself and your firm. Well, uh, myself, I've been in this insurance game for a long time. I don't even want to admit how long, but uh, it's been decades. And uh, the uh, firm I work for, Atlas Insurance Agency, has been around even longer. They were formed in 1929, so they're one of the oldest agencies in the state. And uh, today, by, per PBN, we're, the agency is the largest in the state per premium volume written uh, within all our clients. So, And you do a lot of association insurance. Yes, I actually lead the what we call the AOAO group within Atlas. They have specialty areas and association is one of them. So just to digress for a second, because we're talking about the volcano a minute ago. Do the people on the big island, can you get volcano insurance? Is, is there, can these people be insured or not insured? What is, what is the real scoop on that? Well, within the standard Hawaii market for homeowners, uh, they don't write volcano insurance. What they've done is they started a sort of a pool of last resort. It's called the Hawaii Property Insurance Association, which is sort of a hui of the local insurance carriers who write volcano insurance, lava, fire, in uh, the lava zones. And what's unfortunately happening is that because they write in highly distressed zones, their premiums are probably, if you had a standard policy, like Richard, you own property here in, on Oahu, so you have a, a, a unit on Oahu. Well, their premium's gonna be somewhere in the area of four to 5% uh, times what the premium on a standard policy would be. So it's very expensive. And it's also very restrictive because of the nature of the coverage. So they can get it. There's other forms. Uh, you can go into what we call an excess and surplus lines market. That's going to like to Lloyd's of London. And that's, you know, you're paying the market rate for the exposure. And because the excess and surplus lines market is a open market, whatever, there's no standard forms, there's no standard terms and conditions, and no standard rates. And again, the rates are going to be much, much higher. The deductibles are going to be much, much higher than you would find even in the Hawaii Property Insurance Association pool. Now do you, as a wild guess, do you think that most people had insurance or didn't have insurance over there? Well. Uh, as a wild guess, because of the cost and the locations, uh, I would say uh, a great percentage did not have insurance. When you think uh, standard premium is $1,000, let's say it's $4,000. That's a pretty pricey uh, premium to pay for sort of limited coverage. Also, uh, you know, when people bought in Pune in that area, they're looking for inexpensive housing, land's inexpensive and stuff. So for them to pay that kind of price, many of them did not pay. It kind of reminds me going back to 1992. I actually was on my condo on Kauai when Hurricane Aniki hit Kauai. 
And luckily for me, I was on the North Shore and it was devastating. But the building is kind of a four-story concrete building. And, and I hate to say it, probably my damage was less than $100 on my own unit. Wow. Because uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like a bunker, yeah. is this particular building. It, had, it itself lost roofs and other things as well, so they had a multi-million dollar claim. But we look at the individual owners, they weren't affected. And out of that came the Hawaii Hurricane Relief Fund. Yeah. Is that still around? Is that, is, well, what's the scoop on technically that? Technically, it is around. Uh, the state assesses a, a certain amount for all property transactions and stuff, a small, small percentage, but it's built up over the years. So it's fairly sizable. The, in fact, uh, but it hasn't really, it's been sitting there in the state fund as a hurricane relief fund, but uh, it hasn't issued any policies. Uh, since 1992, several insurance companies have come into the state. Uh, there is hurricane insurance available, readily available, currently today in the state. So uh, it's a fund uh, that is sort of sitting there in reserve in case. Uh, you know, between us, if a hurricane ever hit Oahu, a big one ever hit Oahu, we're going to probably need a fund like the Hurricane Relief Fund because a lot of the carriers will be pulling out those who have come in, or they're going to be really restricted in coverage. So uh, for the most part, it is sitting there in reserve. And right now, uh, there's uh, the interest, and it's growing, so the interest is being trying to be siphoned off by the state to go into the general fund, since it's just Sort of a, I, I know the industry fought that they, you know, it's it's kind of the, our money put in for a specific purpose. They shouldn't be able to rate it for some other purpose, you yeah. know, just because the state needs money. So, but let's go back to what, what an insurance agent does for a second. You know, if, from my perspective, a lot of boards of directors they look at it and they see their policy comes up for renewal, and they think that the agent just gets a renewal Rolls from an existing over. carrier, yeah. and you just renew it every year. Yeah. What does an agent really do when it comes time to renewal? Well, when you talk about renewals and uh, associations in general, I think there's two things you have to understand. One is the agent represents the insurance carriers and licensed with different insurance carriers. So they are an insurance carrier representative. But, you know, in Hawaii, we really feel that we try to represent our associations. So the question is, do we roll them over every year? Is it easy? Or do we really look at marketing and what goes into it? And so the answer is, uh, we have to look at every account individual, uh, depending upon their loss history, depending upon the market they're in. You know, there are not uh, like in California, hundreds of markets who are willing to write hurricane insurance in Hawaii. We have a very limited, you can count on one hand, basically the standard markets who are competitive in uh, hurricane insurance. And uh, you have fingers left over if you talk about frame uh, versus fire resistive. But the fact is, because we have such a limited market, you have to balance knowing that you know, if you market every year and you're one of the three, four carriers that write and you see this account every year, after not getting it a couple of years, where do you think that account goes? Bottom of the pot, no consideration. So what we try to do is, you know, strategically market accounts, they should be marketed at least every three to five years out to the marketplace. But market them every year, sometimes it doesn't make any sense, depending upon claims, depending upon the marketplace in general. Well, one of the things that, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding an agent is, I don't know if the right word is licensed, but is authorized by an insurance company to represent them and, mm -hmm. and present them. So not all agents represent all insurance companies. 
Correct. And yeah. and one of the ones that has come into the market in the last, I'm going to say 10 years, but yeah. uh, exactly. I've lost track of time. You hit it right on the nose. Well, I'm lucky in that. Good yeah. guess. <laughs> but is this firm out of Korea called Dung Boo, mm -hmm. where in the beginning when they came out, there was all sorts of coconut wireless chatter that, oh, if you buy a Dung Boo policy, you're putting your association at risk because there's a claim they may not have enough assets in Hawaii to pay the claim, and mm -hmm. they could walk away. And of course, they withstood those that criticism for ten years. And I know many associations are right with Dungbo, but just for the audience's understanding, tell us who Dungbo is and address this issue about whether they're a creditable resource here in Hawaii. Okay. Well, Dungbo is a South Korean company. Uh, they're the third largest company in South Korea, behind companies like Samsung and some huge companies, uh, but uh, just for Hawaii, Dungbu was in Guam, Saipan area, since the 80s. And they've gone through probably seven, eight typhoons, earthquakes, major losses in, the, in Guam and Saipan. And they've paid the claims. They're still there. They're still right in business. They, in 2006, uh, well, actually now 12 years ago, but they came to Hawaii. Uh, and so they are one of the major carriers. We use, you know, we have access to pretty much all the carriers too, but we were fortunate to be selected by Dungbu to be one of their agents. I think they have seven agents that they have licensed. But uh, the things we care about uh, it are obviously, are they financially sound? Well, they're rated by AMBES. AMBES is the foremost rating agency for insurance companies. Uh, banks use that rating, uh, government agencies use that rating and stuff. And AMBES specializes in rating insurance companies and they have all kinds of tests that they go in. So they measure Dong Bu's rating and they give them an A15. And the A rating says that they're excellent in their claims paying ability with their surplus. And then the uh, 15, it's Roman numeral 15, is the size of the company. So they're rated 15, which is the largest company size within insurance carriers, which means at a minimum they have over two billion of policyholder surplus. Uh, so they are one of the largest, and AMBES says that they have excellent claims paying ability. Now within the state of Hawaii, they're uh, under the supervision, they're admitted, so they're under the supervision of the state commissioner. And uh, when they first came in, there was some criticism, talk, you know, some agents didn't get licensed, whatever, but there was some criticism at Dung Bu. And actually, the insurance commission, commissioner at the time uh, had issued a letter saying, time out, they're an excellent company. They meet all our criteria. They are financially sound. Uh, so, and they supervise continually supervise the company. Now, one of the things about assets in Hawaii that's been brought up before, uh, insurance carriers are required to have so much assets deposited in Hawaii based upon their policy writings, their premium rate. So they, the insurance commissioner measures that. Well, over the years, Dungbu's obviously kept growing and growing, so they had to add more assets. So, you know, so the commissioner would rate and said, okay, you need X amount of assets. Fine. So they've had to add assets over the years. So there might be that time between them getting audited when, until they de deposited the new amount. There might be some lag in terms of they might not meet that requirement. but. They have, and they're in good standing with the insurance commissioner. It's interesting. We're going to take a short break here, and about after I make my little statement here, is that okay. you know my wife's the treasurer of one of our condo associations, mm -hmm. and um, we uh, it was a developer turned over the association to the board, and so we were in the process, or she was in the process of, along with the rest of the board, reviewing insurance policies, and we went to your agency as well as a couple other agencies, and. And, uh, and I would say nothing against this carrier, but uh, the developer had written it with um, Lloyds of London as a non-admitted carrier. Mm -hmm. When we went out to review and try to improve on our insurance, we were able to get through your agency the best quote, and it was written through Dung Bu. 
and we had a lengthy discussion to make the board did with you on uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. to make sure that it met the necessary criteria. So, in general, I think we should just remember Dung Boo is an admitted carrier. They're licensed to do business in Hawaii. They're a A15 carrier that they're worthy of consideration, you know, and Absolutely. and you, they can ask all the tough questions, which you should as a board or an owner, but uh, let's cut the uh, argument whether or not they are a reliable source here in Hawaii, because I think they've demonstrated over the last 10 years, through their excellent claim paying as well, uh, that they are a reliable source here in Hawaii. And on that note, we're gonna take a short one minute break, and we'll be right back with my good friend, Ron Sukamaki, and talk about association insurance. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hey, aloha, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy. I host a program called Security Matters Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us on Fridays. Uh, we air at 10 a.m. And we're going to be talking about those security things that really should be important to you. And, you know, maybe get behind the scenes on some, some things that you may not know about the industry or about products or even about your habits. Um, security is all about people, processes, and products, and we hope to bring that to you in an informative and um, hopefully a useful way. So again, 10, 10 a.m. on Fridays, Security Matters Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm sitting here with Ron Sukamaki from Atlas Insurance. And We've had a very interesting discussion about uh, our friends in the, in the Big Island and volcano insurance, and uh, we talked about hurricanes, and now I want to get back to the basics. And, uh, and basically, when we look at a condo association, under the statute, they have certain obligations to provide certain types of insurance. It's not even a choice. And so I'd like to start out with what I'm going to call property insurance. And, and what is what is property insurance and kind of what, what is the short summary of what's provided under that? <laughs> well, I try to make it as simple and says property insurance. We, we base it on two things. What is the property you want to insure and need to insure? And what are the perils that you're going to insure them for? So if you said it's... Is it a covered property? Yeah. Is it a covered property? Bam. We have coverage. And so uh, in condo, uh, 514B, as you indicated, requires uh, all associations to carry property insurance for their common area elements and limited common area elements, too. So there we, that's right out of the first paragraph within the statutes under insurance. So. Property insurance is what we cover, uh, need to cover for associations. Uh, the perils we call, the old name used to be all risk, but all risk has exclusions. So the insurance industry to try to eliminate the perception of we cover everything, uh, changed it called special perils. But it used to be what we call all risk. And basically that includes all, you know, um, all perils that are not excluded, and the major areas that we cover are fire, water damage, hurricane, for most of our clients. Uh, the big major exclusions tend to be flood, earthquake, uh, big one, wear and tear. You know, we get into this battle constantly, and uh, but wear and tear, uh, you know, certain uh, I would say construction defects, things like that, that they don't cover. But so where do they get flood insurance? Then, they, if, because I know that's an issue of that. You know, particularly in Hawaii, there are flood areas, and there, I know there's flood zones and, and and the flood maps and those types of things. So, if they <clears throat> if that's an exclusion, where, where do they get flood insurance? And 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 are they required to have it 
Only if they're in the flood zone? Mm -hmm. Well, they get flood insurance. Most, uh, most uh, of the coverage is through the National Flood Association FEMA program. Uh, that is pretty standard. And it's also subsidized by the government, which they're trying to take away that subsidy over the next few years. But uh, so most carriers write through the National Flood Association. The, the requirement really goes into, uh, even in uh, 514B, they talk about uh, associations should consider flood insurance if you're in a high hazard flood zone. And that is an A or a V flood zone, which means you're within the 100-year flood zone. Uh, the other, uh, if you're outside, and flood insurance through National Flood is building specific. They insure this building and then another policy for that building, so it's building specific. So you might have buildings that are outside the flood zone, and, and technically uh, you don't have to carry it. But like I tell a lot of clients, if you're close to a flood zone boundary. Uh, I've never known a flood to stop because the line says stop, right? And in fact, 20% of all floods paid through the National Flood Association are paid in non-hazardous zones. Wow. And so that's one reason we encourage our clients to consider flood. But, you know, if you're on top of a hill, maybe not. You know, but if you're beside a stream, uh, we've had a uh, a lot of climate change, a lot of flooding that hadn't existed before. So besides property, what other types of policies are associations mandated to carry? Certainly general liability. You know, the associations, uh, you know, you have the trip and falls and all those kinds of liabilities. So general liability is a pretty standard coverage. Uh, most of the terms and conditions are mandated by law, so, and the policy forms are all pretty much the same. So that's one of the major coverages that all associations carry. And the term I, we hear a lot is umbrella. What is, what is an umbrella policy? Yeah, it's sort of descriptive of the kind of coverage. Umbrella goes over the top of like your general liability policy. Uh, it goes over the top of your, if you had an auto or auto liability policy, it'll go over the top of the auto liability policy. It will, uh, in, we have um, specialty umbrella coverages that will actually go over the top of directors and officers policies. And uh, lastly, it goes over the top of what we call under workers' comp, there's an employee liability policy that uh, coverage, and it'll go over the top of the employee liability. You know, one of the things we hear around the industry a lot is that one of the challenges in insurance in Hawaii for associations is director and officer liability, that there's been a lot of claims and a lot of increased costs, and it's not profitable to the carriers, and, and there's a lot of consternation over that. Is that accurate, or how do you, what do you see from your end? Well, it's absolutely accurate, unfortunately, because uh, we just had a meeting with a regional manager for one of the largest DNO carriers for condominiums, uh, and they basically in indicated that Hawaii's loss history over the past two years, most recent two years, has been significantly higher than their national program. Uh, so they are reviewing their rates as we speak and they will probably be filing for rate increases later on in the year. So that's, uh, that is a problem uh, in Hawaii. We've had a couple of things that we've seen a lot more of recently, and one has been uh, there was a uh, non-judicial foreclosure act, and it, it, I think the net has been now over 50 associations are drug into this. And the outcome is still unknown, but it's, uh, you know, it's costing the DNO carriers a lot for legal fees. And in fact, uh, last year, the statistic from Hawaii was the average condominium claim cost over $30,000. Uh, and most of that's legal fees. And when you think that most associations for a million dollars of limits pay around $2,000, $3,000, you know, when you look at the average claim being uh, over 30, that's 
why well, the, we have it. Well, the industry as a whole has tried to mitigate that. I'm not saying it's been totally successful by having legislation passed, guaranteeing what we call value to mediation before a judge, and let's talk about it before we sue each other to try to reduce these claims. And the success of that program has been very good in the sense, I think most, about 80% of the claims that go to this mediation get resolved without going through all this legal process and costs. So hopefully people out there will start to realize that making, continuing to make claims is not gonna be healthy to the industry. Oh. You know, and, uh, and because I see a lot of these claims, I would say a lot of them are on the edge of being something that, you know, you can really make a legitimate argument about. So, uh, but uh, I see it's a real issue for the industry because everybody's costs are going to go up, which means maintenance fees are going to go up. Yeah. Well, I, I think you hit part of the answer in the associations in the industry has to do more to prevent claims. You know, you get into this dollar trading, uh, you know, you got coverage, so okay, you know, but, and have the insurance companies step up and pay all those. Well, they're not a nonprofit. They're gonna try to recover those costs. So uh, the rates are gonna go up significantly. And, uh, you know, again, Specialized condo programs, there's basically three of them that really write a majority of the condos in Hawaii. And uh, if you start turning in claims and you get kicked out of that group, you're, you're back to a the hole. The wild, wild west and the non standard market is going to be expensive. Very. You know, I probably have a hundred more questions for you, but we're down to our last minute. Oh, so wow. I'm going to thank you for being here and ask you if you'd be happy to come back sometime and talk some more about this so we can educate our board members and owners. Would you be willing to come back at a future date? Absolutely. And I want to thank all of you on watching Condo Insider, our weekly show about association living. Uh, Jane Sugimura, my co-host, will be here next week with an exciting show. We hope you can tune in. Aloha.